It seems like everyone is trying to avoid gluten these days, and it's especially important for those with an autoimmune condition to consider avoiding this food allergen. But some people want to know if they are sensitive to gluten, and in this video I'm going to discuss a few of the more common gluten sensitivity tests available, and of course I'll let you know which one I think is the best one to do to determine if you have a gluten sensitivity. Before I begin, I just want to remind you that the main reason I put together these videos is to help people with different types of autoimmune conditions and other health issues better understand their test results so that they can find and remove their triggers, correct any underlying imbalances, and feel great again. Let's start off by discussing some basics about gluten sensitivity testing. And to learn more about gluten and autoimmunity, you'll want to check out my previous video, and I'll include a link in the description below. Many people don't understand the difference between testing for celiac disease and testing for a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. I won't go into detail here about celiac disease testing, but a celiac panel looks at a few markers, including anti-gluten antibodies and transglutaminase, and some also look at what's called endomycial antibodies. On the other hand, if someone tests positive for anti-gliadin alone, but if they're negative for the other antibodies I just mentioned, then they might just have a gluten sensitivity. To make matters more confusing, there is genetic testing for celiac disease, and while testing positive for these markers doesn't confirm the presence of celiac disease, if you test negative for these, this almost always rules out celiac disease. So let's say you, you can see here the genetic markers are HLA DQ2 and HLA DQ8. So if you don't have either of these markers, then you only have about a 5% chance of having celiac disease. On the other hand, if one of these or if both of these are positive, then you have a much greater chance of developing celiac disease, but the presence of these genetic markers doesn't confirm that you have celiac disease, and it doesn't guarantee that you will develop celiac disease in the future. So what's the difference between a wheat allergy test and a gluten sensitivity test? Food allergies are typically referred to as being IgE-mediated. In other words, they involve something called IgE immunoglobulins. And so a wheat allergy also involves IgE immunoglobulins. Food sensitivities involve immunoglobulin G or IgG. So IgG antibodies are found in all body fluids and they play an important role in fighting bacterial and viral infections. These are involved in delayed type reactions and they aren't always accompanied by overt symptoms. While someone who has an IgE mediated food allergy will present with symptoms within the first two hours of exposure to the allergen, and frequently within a few seconds or minutes, it can take a few days for someone with an IgG food sensitivity to develop symptoms. I'm going to discuss three different ways to test for a gluten sensitivity. All three of these methods measure anti-gliadin antibodies, but some of the tests are more comprehensive. It's extremely important to know that you need to have recently eaten gluten for this test to be positive, for any of these tests to be positive. And I'm not suggesting that you should eat gluten if you have been gluten-free for a few weeks or months, but if this is the case, then you would not want to do any of these tests, as any of these will most likely come back negative if you're not eating gluten, even if you're sensitive to gluten. And even if you decide to eat gluten and then do one of these tests, you would have to wait a few weeks for antibodies to develop. The first way to test for a gluten sensitivity is through the blood, and there are two different types of blood tests I'm going to discuss. First of all, you can do blood testing for anti-gliadin antibodies at a standard lab, such as LabCorp or Quest Diagnostics. The main benefit of this is that it probably won't be as expensive as some of the other options I'm going to mention, but a downside of this test is that it's only looking at a single marker, and you can't rely on a single negative marker to rule out a gluten sensitivity. In other words, if you were to visit a regular lab such as LabCorp and you got a blood test for anti-gliadin that came back negative, this does not mean that you don't have a sensitivity to gluten. On the other hand, if you did this test and it came back positive, then in all likelihood it would mean that you are reacting to gluten. The second blood test I'd like to discuss is from the company Cyrex Labs. This is their array number three, also known as the Wheat Gluten Proteome Reactivity and Autoimmunity Test. So once again, this is a blood test, and I consider this to be the most comprehensive test for determining if someone has a gluten sensitivity. One of the main downsides of using Cyrex Labs is that you need to visit a lab affiliated with them to get the blood draw, as you can't just visit a standard lab such as LabCorp or Quest. Another downside of the Ray number 3 is that it's quite expensive. 
A final downside is that false negatives are possible if someone has depressed immunoglobulins. But the good news is that you can test the serum immunoglobulins before doing this test, and I'll include a link in the description below to this test. So here we see the array number three from Cyrex Labs, and you can see how more comprehensive this test is. As with most tests, they're just looking at these markers, at alpha gliadin, and you can see here, this looks at IgG and IgA for each of these markers, but it looks at wheat, it looks at wheat germ gluten, and besides alpha gliadin, it looks at gamma gliadin, omega gliadin, glutenin, gluteomorphin, and then we see transglutaminase, but there's three types of transglutaminase. So there's transglutaminase 2, transglutaminase 3, and transglutaminase 6. So 2 is associated with the intestine. So that's what they're testing for when you get a regular celiac panel, let's say at a lab core or Quest Diagnostics. They don't label it as transglutaminase 2, but th that's what it is. And then transglutaminase 3 that relates to the skin. So if this were positive, if this was out of range, that would mean that there's an autoimmune response to transglutaminase 3. So again, with 2, it would mean that you're going to have problems with the intestines. But if this is positive, that usually means that you have problems with the skin, uh, an autoimmune reaction to, um, to the skin. And then with transglutaminase 6, this usually is neurological. So definitely more comprehensive. And we see also, obviously, everything that's in the green that's in range is in range but here we see one marker that's equivocal and nothing that's out of range here according to cyrex labs anything equivocal is still out of range it's one standard deviation out of range and if it's out of range it's two standard deviations out of range so here we see this marker is equivocal and in this case, the person that they would recommend for the person to still avoid gluten if any of these. Now, now, again, in a perfect world, as I said in the previous video, everybody probably should avoid gluten, especially those with an autoimmune condition. But you can make the argument that if someone is eating gluten and if everything was in range and assuming that they had healthy levels of immunoglobulins, that maybe it's OK for them to eat gluten occasionally. But if any of these are equivocal or out of range, you would want to avoid eating gluten. And then we see, if I could advance to this next slide here, there we go. So not as colorful as the first one, but we could see it's a lot worse. You could see that there's four equivocal markers, and then we see five markers out of range, including two of the transglutaminase. So this is an autoimmune reaction to gluten that's taken place. So this person would want to avoid gluten permanently. And this Cyrex labs, they, they mention how this isn't diagnostic of celiac disease, but since you see the transglutaminase 2 as being elevated, then this is suggestive of celiac disease. And then they also have the transglutaminase 6. So it wouldn't be surprising if this person is experiencing neurological symptoms. And that's why also sometimes you'll hear myself and other practitioners say that you can't just go by gut symptoms because some people, if, if someone has transglutaminase 2 elevated, then perhaps they will have gut symptoms if they're exposed to gluten. But if someone is negative for transglutaminase 2, and let's say they have transglutaminase 6, which is the case here, then they could have neurological symptoms and not experience intestinal symptoms. So in this case, there is no question that this person needs to avoid gluten, probably needs to avoid gluten permanently. But then when we look at this one, again, this person probably should avoid gluten as well but it probably would be debatable whether this person should avoid gluten permanently or just until they get into a state of remission. Again, a lot of healthcare practitioners would say if this person has autoimmunity to avoid gluten permanently regardless, but it's obvious that this isn't, as, this isn't nearly as bad as this case here. You can also measure anti-gliadin antibodies through the saliva. The adrenal stress index from diagnostics includes this marker, of course, the main benefit of this is that it's already included in this panel, but a downside is that a negative result does not rule out a gluten sensitivity. The truth is that I'm not thrilled that they include the anti gliadin marker on the adrenal stress index test, as it's commonly negative, which isn't a bad thing, but it means I need to explain to the patient that they can't rely on this marker to rule out a gluten sensitivity. On the other hand, if this marker is positive, then you definitely should avoid eating gluten. So here we see the gliadin antibodies on the adrenal stress index test. And here it is clearly positive. 
it's a 16, positive greater than 15, but quite frankly, even if it was within the borderline range of 13 to 15, this person should avoid gluten. And while this is an example of a positive finding, you could see here that patients on a gluten-free diet who have not been exposed to gluten for three months or longer should have a negative response to gliadin. So that's why I was saying earlier that you need to have gluten in your system in order for this test to come out positive, assuming you are sensitive to gluten. You can also test for anti-gliadin antibodies in the stool, and there are a few different companies that offer this. One of them is Enterolab, and as you can see on the slide, they claim that the rationale of using stool rather than blood for testing for food sensitivity is that immunologic reactions to proteins in the diet that cause these reactions are centered within the intestinal tract and not in the blood. Enterolab measures the fecal IgA antibodies against gliadin along with tissue transglutaminase, which if positive confirms celiac disease. The GI map from Diagnostic Solutions tests for the fecal IgA antibody against gliadin, but not tissue transglutaminase. So the benefit of this marker is that it's, at least with the GI map, it's already included on the GI map. But I must admit that I question the accuracy of testing for anti-gliadin antibodies in the stool. And the reason for this is because I've had a few patients test positive for anti-gliadin on the GI map, even though they assured me that they were 100% gluten free. And perhaps in some cases, I'm sure there might have been cross contamination. So maybe the person thought they were avoiding gluten when they really weren't. But there are a few cases when the person told me that they were strictly avoiding gluten, no possibility of cross contamination. And, and again, I had a few patients mention this, not just one or two. So I do question a little bit whether or not there are false positive results with stool testing. So this is an example of a gluten sensitivity stool test from Enterolab. And we could see here that they test for fecal anti-gliadin IgA. And you can see the range is less than 10 and this person is 36. So if all we were seeing was this value, I don't know if I would rely on this, but this also looks at fecal anti-tissue transglutaminase. And again, normal range for this also should be less than 10 units. And this is positive, which would be indicative of celiac disease. Now, I still might want to see a blood test just confirming this, but this being that there's two markers here showing that the person's sensitive to gluten, including the transglutaminase, which indicates there's an autoimmune response. So that definitely is more convincing than just looking at a positive fecal anti-gliadin IgA. This also looks at the fecal fat, which in this case, this is normal, less than 300. So that's good. And then this person also got tested for anti-casein, which is in a protein in milk, so milk sensitivity, and positive for this as well. Normal range less than 10. You can see it's 45 here. And then they also do the genetic testing for gluten sensitivity, or, or really for celiac disease. And you can see here that HLA gene analysis reveals that you have a copy of one of the main genes that predisposes to gluten sensitivity and celiac sprue. So again, it doesn't mean just because someone is positive doesn't mean that they have celiac disease, but since this person has genetics and also has transglutaminase positive, as well as the fecal anti-gliadin IgA positive, but more importantly, the transglutaminase being positive. So this person in all likelihood has celiac disease. So this is an intestinal health section from the GI map. And you could see here that they test for anti-gliadin IgA and clearly elevated 311. You could see the range zero to 157. And as I mentioned earlier, I question whether in some cases you could have a false positive result with anti-gliadin. In this case though, I would be based on a few factors, think that there would be a stronger test that this is a true positive now, secretory IgA is low, and I see this low in a lot of people. So this alone, or even this in combination with the anti-gliadin IgA, wouldn't make me necessarily think that this person definitely has uh, gluten sensitivity. And again, secretory IgA lines the mucosal surfaces of the body, especially the gastrointestinal tract. And it's not a leaky gut marker, but when it's low, pretty good chance someone has a leaky gut. And gluten can cause a leaky gut. I mentioned in the previous video how 2015, a study showed that gluten can cause a leaky gut in everybody. So again, maybe these two are related, but then calprotectin, this is an inflammatory marker. And this, whereas secretory IgA, I see this low a lot on this test. Calprotectin, I do see it high, but I can't say it's as common as secretory IgA. 
as far as being out of range. So with this clear ladder range, 253, normal less than 173. And so perhaps in this case, the gluten not only is causing a leaky gut, but it's causing some gut inflammation. There could be other reasons why calprotectin is elevated and also why secretory IgA is low. Gut infections can cause either of those findings. Inflammatory bowel disease is a reason why calprotectin may be elevated, although usually I'll see this a lot higher, especially with ulcerative colitis. I usually will see this greater than 1,000, but it depends on the person. If the person has been doing a lot of things to support the gut, even if they have inflammatory bowel disease, then we might see calprotectin elevated, but on the lower side, or in some cases, maybe normal if they're doing a lot of good things for their gut health. But again, in this case, either way, I would tell the person to avoid gluten, but if the person was eating gluten, if they were consuming gluten regularly, without question, yeah, th these findings would, or I, I shouldn't say without question, but I would highly question whether the, this marker, low secretory IgA and calprotectin is due to the consumption of gluten. And if the person claimed they weren't eating gluten, I would suspect maybe there's some cross-contamination. Although, as I mentioned before, secretory IgA could be low for other reasons and calprotectin can be elevated for other reasons as well. So what's the best test for a gluten sensitivity? In my opinion, it is the Ray number three from Cyrex Labs. Even though it's expensive and you can't just go to any lab for the blood draw, this panel is the most comprehensive test for a gluten sensitivity out there. And as long as you have healthy levels of immunoglobulins, it is pretty accurate. And because it tests for many of the markers associated with gluten, false negatives are less common with this test. According to the research, gluten causes a leaky gut in everyone. And if you want to know which is the best test to determine if you have a leaky gut, you'll want to check out this video that popped up on the screen. If you enjoyed this current video you just watched, please click on the like button below. And if you have any questions on testing for a gluten sensitivity, please let me know in the comments below.